Hi everyone, this is Kim Alia, and welcome to a very special presentation that's going to be given by my very good friends Franz Vermeulen and Linda Johnston. Uh, I'm going to just give Franz and Linda a very quick introduction. I've introduced them a number of times on these various talks. They've been very generous in their time and, and in their willingness to present all the information they have to share. Uh, as I mentioned, these are two of my dearest friends. Uh, both of them are incredibly erudite and knowledgeable homeopaths. Uh, Franz is probably the foremost contemporary researcher of homeopathy in the world today. I consider his books to be an absolute uh, essential, essential works in the study and practice of homeopathy. Linda Johnson is an incredibly also intelligent and erudite homeopath and a very, very excellent prescriber. Uh, she's one of the foremost practitioners in our community today. Uh, these two people have contributed tremendously to the study and practice of homeopathy. They're really two of the great gems that we have in our community. I just want to, before we, I pass it over to them, I want to mention that we have their wonderful new book. It's published in the UK. It's a, a beautiful publication, and it's the newest work uh, by Franz Vermeulen. It's called The Concordant Reference, second edition, and we do currently have that on sale for $145. The retail price is 190. So if you haven't if you haven't gotten a copy of this, it's it's well worth having. As I said, it's one of the um, it's probably the, the foremost single materia medica work in, in the world today. So I'm going to pass it over to you, Franz and Linda. Okay. Show my screen. Yep. Okay. There we go. Okay. Good. Well, said that little one welcome, and we are going to talk today about the art and science of the Materia Medica. The Materia Medica has a long history in and of itself, and very few of us actually know where it comes from, and what it, how reliable it is, and what the sources are, and that uh, is really my husband Franz's expertise. So, for that, I'm going to turn it over to him, and he can introduce his topic. Uh, be, Franz, before you start, I did want to mention to everybody on the call that uh, Franz and Linda are going to present for about 45 minutes, and they're going to leave about 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers. So if you have any questions, you know, write them down, and then at the very end you'll have an opportunity to type them into the control panel, and I'll read the questions and relay them verbally to Franz and Linda. If you want, you can type in questions as soon as they come to your mind. Okay, sorry about that. Go ahead. Not to worry. Hello, everyone. Well, I tried to go to the next yeah, picture. There, there we are. Okay, go ahead. What I'm going to tell uh, is probably um, I, I'm, I won't actually have enough time to tell what I want to tell. Therefore, I'm happy to announce that. Kim has made available two of my articles that I wrote on the background of the Materia Medica. One is called Trust But Verify. The other one is called Materia Medica Standing on Shifted, Shifting Sands, which have all the details. So what I'm now I'm going to do is give you the, the outlines of how I think that the Materia Medica has come into existence and why it is as it is and what are the disadvantages and the advantages of the Materia Medica as we have it. And I dare say that it is a development to understand the Materia Medica. Maybe it's only something that applies to me. Maybe it's my development that I see in it, or maybe it's recognizable uh, for others as well. So Materia Medica has been, been my uh, daily bread and butter, if I, if that's how it is said, is that how it is said? Well, that has been my daily business for the last 20 to 25 years, and the 20 years before that, I um, used to be a practitioner. But over the last 20 years, I've done nothing else than looking into the Materia Medica, so I dare say that I think to know how it has been composed over time. So I started out making a compilation of the traditional Materia Medica, calling it Concordant. And in these days, I had certain beliefs, and it is about those beliefs and how those beliefs have developed into the current project, which 
uh, is called current reference. That's what I'm going to talk about. So you see here, Herring's guiding symptoms at the time of appearance. This is what um, Herring wrote in the introduction to the third volume. He had left it behind for those who were going to continue his work because um, Herring died on uh, July 15, 1880, when he just had finished Calcarea Carbonica for the printer for his guiding symptoms. And he it was just done with cactus. So from Calcarea Carbonica, everything is done after that by three of his companions, his son-in-law and two other German descent homeopaths. And those, what you find here is what uh, Herring wrote. Now, notice that he says, what I've underlined, that he believed that there would be no interest in an exhaustive work no interest in exhaustive work. In other words, people were always looking for something short, something brief, something that would save them time, something that would help them quickly to make a decision. So, with that in mind, either condensed or exhaustive, we come to the, uh, a peer review that I found on volume two of the guiding symptoms. And there it says, interestingly, that the art science topic, which has always been a question in homeopathy, is it art or is it science, was solved in the, in the following way. It said, for the mere artist, it suffices to know that the symptom is reliable. It doesn't look that way. Okay, that's... Here, okay, I need the next one. The next slide? Yeah. There we go. And for a scientist, he needs to know all the details. So he may judge on the basis of the details whether he is going to accept a symptom or reject it. For an artist, in other words, that's not necessary to know all the details. He only needs a master on whom he can rely, a master on whom he can rely. And then the peer reviewer said, the guiding symptom is the work for the artist. In other words, we can rely on the master who wrote it, Herring. And Allen's encyclopedia is the work for the scientist because it has all the details. And by following the details, you can decide whether you're going to accept or reject. I thought it was a very interesting division made and a clear one. Herring is the art part, Alan is the science part. Okay, so did I understand that 20 years ago? No, I didn't. So what was I taught at school? of which 20 years later, the Concordant Materia Medica was the result. It was what I was taught, how homeopathy was um, founded, based, and constructed. Which masters did we have at school? And were we taught to judge on the basis of all details placed before us? No, we had Clark, Kent, Herring, and a little bit of Ellen. Linda is going to say, going to tell how it was at her school. Well, when I started homeopathy about 30 years ago, there were so few books. In fact, Vermeulen hadn't even uh, written any books. So at that point, we had Kent, Kent's lectures, Kent's repertory, Burica. And then for the really uh, very industrious student, you could buy the 10 volumes of Herring and the 12 volumes of uh, Allen. Uh, but they were so in, uh, detailed and so complicated and so difficult to, to wade through, very few students actually pursued that. We, we were that kind of student saying, I have a patient in front of me and I want something condensed that summarizes. And of course, we went to Burica at that point. 
There were uh, beginning to be some books, for example, Gibson, which has now been published by Beaconsfield Publishers, at that time was only 11th generation photocopies that were passed around among students. But we were, at that point, there was really no curiosity about the material medical because we were so concerned, as many students are, with finding the remedy that we just took it for granted that the Materia Medica was completely reliable. We didn't question what was included in there. If it was published, and these were our masters, our forerunners like Clark and Burka and Kent, then what they wrote was reliable and we didn't need to question it. When I started out with uh, compiling the Concordant, I started with Burka and Fatak. That book never came in English because it was only done in, in, in Dutch. But I started then to see that there was a lot of overlap. There were, if there were 20 different Materia Medicas by different, 20 different homeopaths written, then 90% of it would be the same. I started to understand that. So in putting that together, I used 10 different sources and came to the conclusion that these more or less must have covered everything that was available. In, after some time, I understood that actually most of it was already in herring. So why would I bother with nine others when it was already in herring? So I put in herring in the second round where it says herring included. And by that, I believed even that it was better than the one before because it was even more complete. There was no greater master in the Materia Medica than Harry was. I even had a picture of the man on my wall. He was one of my heroes. He was the summum. He was the top. And I and take nothing back of it. But over time, I came to understand that I was mistaken. So let's have a look. I'm going to guide you through the guiding symptom, how it is constructed. And by understanding how it is constructed, you will see what the consequences are for our Materia Medica and how wrong we are in certain areas of our Materia Medica or repertories. Now, what you need to do is you need to have the book where is the introduction to the remedies. Now that starts only with caustican because for some, for me, incomprehensible reason, Herring never told where he got his symptoms from. Now I happen to know where he got them from because it is told in his uh, biography written by his son-in-law, Nur. There it says that Herring checked and screened the magazines, the journals, the periodicals, the transactions of his days and cut out the symptoms on a slip of paper and wrote on it the remedy and wrote on it the source, the reference, but he never put it in his book, which is absolutely completely unscientific. But maybe if we take him as an artist, we shouldn't blame him for not being scientific. So you need to start at causticum and from causticum all remedies have an introduction and that introduction includes an introduction of where it comes from the remedy who did some provings etc and then it gives clinical authorities causticum starts here irrespective of the clinical cases taken i can't Cancel it. Uh, just a second here. That's the best I can do. Okay. Taken from a Rückert's collection and Stubbs archives and the older journals, blah, blah. The rest you can read for yourself. So it says essentially where they got their material from on which they based the material medica to construct. So now remember Rückert and remember Stubbs. One further. Rückert. Klinische Erfahrungen in der Homeopathie, eine vollständige Sammlung von. It says, clinical experience in the homeopathy, a complete collection from uh, 18, 1822 to 1858, was uh, collected by Rückert. He started in 1822 and he ended in 1855. And he, as you can see there, he collected cases from the literature. 
and usually it stands as cool erf, say, see at the bottom there, in the guiding symptoms introduction. This is an important background source for the guiding symptoms. Second is Stapf. Stapf was a co-member of the um, Proofers Union of uh, Hanuman. And he uh, started a journal called Archive, which is in English translated as Archives. And that started in 1822 and it appeared until 1846. And later you see there an edition of Cross. Cross was one of the students of Hanuman. Then the third one that they used often is Alkemeine. Uh, that still exists. That's a journal that started in 1833 and it had certain uh, editors over time. Among the ones I mentioned there, Gross, Hartmann and Rummel, they were all three students of Hahnemann. So they were from the beginning in the homeopathic field publishing cases and these cases are the basis for the guiding symptoms. Now, this is a little bit of a, a lot to overlook, but this is what you get next. And after the introduction where Rückert and Stapf are mentioned, you see clinical authorities, you get all these names, and you get all these journals, and you get all these pages where it is from. These cases make up the guiding symptoms. These cases make up the guiding symptoms. How did that go? Let's have a look. First, you get the name of the complaint for which Causticum was prescribed. Then you get the name of the author, Barry, which was from London. Then you get the name of the journal, which is in uh, abbreviations. And so you need to know how these journals were named, where they were published, etc., etc. If you can access these journals, you can check the cases against how it is being put in guiding symptoms. That's an, an way how you can find out how guiding symptom is done. Now, then you go to the end of guiding symptoms, causticum chapter, where you find stages of life constitution. There, all the cases that have been collected from the journals are mentioned one by one. First, there are some general observations, as you can see at the beginning, and then you will see child, child, boy, girl, girl, and so on, and so on. Yeah, read it for yourself. The ones that I have underlined and put in italics, I have found back in the journals. The ones I have not underlined and didn't put in italics, I couldn't find back because they are either from Stapf or they are from Rückert. And Rückert I didn't have at the time, but all the other journals I do have, so I can check them out. Examples, pain in the face, Dr. Mossa, homeopathische kliniek, neue Zeitschrift. There stands the date and it stands the case. Notice this, 30 year old woman with pain in face and teeth, first on the left side, first by cold air, covers the face, even in best and warm room, caustic and 30 cured. That's the case, that's it. Next, you go to price on croup. American observer. Now notice this. He is an alternator. He alternates. Now alternation was something that was frowned upon by the later ones. Alternation means you give one remedy and a second one in the evening, one in the morning and the other one in the evening, and you alternate because you can't choose. Or you believe that the alternation is more effective in the treatment. So Apparently, that was for the composers of uh, guiding symptoms not a problem because causticum is only part of the alternation cycle, as you can see, to complete the cure. And still, the case S is put under causticum. Next one, Van der Heiden. Alkemeine homeopathische Zeitung. Have seen very good effects of causticum and paralysis of an arm and pharyngeal muscles after diphtheria. That's it. No more. It's not a full case, not a constitutional treatment, just one line. Next, sciatica. Read it for yourself. That's it. That's the symptom as, that he got out of the uh, Alkemeine homeopathy societal, cut it out, put it on a slip of paper, put the reference on it, and as such it ended up in the guiding symptoms. 
So, is that a problem? Well, it depends on how you're going to evaluate this. How are you going to interpret this? Now, you will notice when you go into this business and you follow the symptoms where they came from, what the original cases are, how they are described, and how they end up in the guiding symptoms, that you will usually find in front of any of these sentences a bold line, a bold line, a bold line. This needs to be underlined because we simply don't understand that fact, that that's how guiding syndrome was made. But the evaluation of the bold line was done by Kent, not by Herring or his followers. So the bold line says, and this is the line from guiding symptoms, incapacity to think or to follow his business after injurious effects of gaslight. That comes from a case by Gardner, senior. But there is no reference. So Gardner probably lived in Philadelphia and he knew Herring personally. So maybe one evening under a cigar or a cup of coffee, he told him, listen, I've seen this symptom. Okay, Herring says, I'll write it down and put it in my guiding symptoms. Next, anxiety despondency has been subjected to night watching care, trouble, etc. in Akalatia. So, so no, no breast milk. That case comes from Frost from the Hanumanian Monsley. Has a bold line. It's one case. Next bold line on the Korea, double bold line even, a case from Mossa. Look there. Why does it have a double bold line? Because the same symptom apparently has been observed in three circumstances. Chronic headache, face and toothache, and Korea. Next bold line, sight obscured. Next bold line, obscuration of vision for a moment on blowing nose comes from Berridge case where it says sight impaired by blowing nose in the case. That's the case. It's one case. It's one person. It's one symptom. Has a bold line. Bold line symptoms by Kent tend to be higher graded. He put them in the second or the third degree, italics or bold. If you look at what there is under mind causticum, I've done it for many remedies, but I can show you the, uh, the context that everything gets skewed, everything gets out of context. There are 70 lines or 70 sentences, which we could call symptoms under the mind of causticum. 43 have a bold line. That is 61% of the total of, of the mind section of causticum is more than the lowest degree. How is that possible? How can that be 60% in, and so the rest is less. In other words, I was told that the grading meant the reliability of the symptom because it was related to the number of times that it had been observed in approving. This turns out to be not at all the case. It's not that it has been a number of times observed. It has been indicating that it was taken from a case from the literature and Kent mistook that as the confirmation of a proving symptom. Wrong, completely wrong. We can see that when we look at the, at the relationship between bold, between italics and between lowest gradings in the various materia medicas, we will see that it is out of proportion and herring has most of the bold and italic symptoms. What does that tell us? It tells us that herring is not into the proving symptoms. Herring are clinical symptoms, that's it. Then we get the very ironical situation that Kent, in the first place, by mixing up the gradations completely, by mistaking this, as suggesting that it says something about the reliability that Kent, who was a proponent of dynamic prescribing, that is, he had his own range of potencies in which he believed, that we will know those, the 30, the 200, the 1 and the 10 and the 50 and the CM, he is looking into 
cases when none of these processes is ever used. Because the Germans used usually 3x, 6x, 12x, maybe 30 every now and then, and with a high um, highly occasional to 200, but never above it. And since most of the materia medica from guiding symptoms comes from the Germans or from German-related American prescribers, it was mostly low potency, frequently repeated, low decimals, not the centesimals. So it is rather ironic that Kent proposes on the basis of the text, which he called guiding symptoms, his idea of the high potencies where it is not based at all, the, the guiding symptoms on high potencies. So it brings the matter of the potency war to the forefront, and the potency war has always been a vicious one in the history of homeopathy, and it has led to all kinds of controversies which have affected the ultimate um, outcome of the materia medica. For instance, Herring had his enemy in Hempel. Hempel was an excellent translator. He was German as well. He translated cases from the German uh, journals as well. He put them in his materia medica. Now I've been going through that and I have to compliment the man. Excellent. Good translations, good cases. <clears throat> You had Lippe, and Lippe had war with Hale, the one of the new remedies. And so are there a number of wars that have, to, in, in, in a certain time, led to proposals to clean up the materia medica. There were those who said everything that has been put in the materia medica that has not been confirmed by two or more proofers need to be thrown out. There were others who said everything that has been produced by potencies lower than the 30 needs to be thrown out because it cannot be reliable, and so on, and so on. So ultimately, we should be lucky that none of it has happened. Herring sets the tone. The materia medica, as we have it, ultimately comes down to Herring. Until I realized that we had overlooked Alan. Alan is the one who's collected all the provings. Alan is the one who is responsible for all the lower graded symptoms because, yeah, Kent couldn't make a second or a third degree out of it because they were not there. When I realized that, I realized that my concordant as it was was out of balance because I put most of my emphasis on herring and by that I put most of my emphasis on what clinically had been observed. However you want to judge the reliability of these observations, I leave that to you. But by emphasizing herring, the text is out of balance because it doesn't contain Allen. After I put Allen in, all of a sudden I had loads of remedies more because how many of these traditional remedies actually have been observed in the clinic? Now, 350, perhaps, maybe 400, maybe 450. That's about it. That's about what guiding symptom contains. So if guiding symptoms would be our guideline, we would have a very low number of remedies. But Alan has about 1,200. So if we count that together and we include Burdick, who uses much eclectic sources, I come to 1,284, as I have now. So, Alan is the, the man of the provings. Now, before I get there, tell me which remedy this is. Well, you can't talk to me, but so I assume you have thought this out for yourself. Right? These are just straight from the, from the guiding symptoms, and they also appear in the lectures of uh, Kent. Sure. Uh, do, you me, do you want me to take some? Symptoms. Do you want me it's to? It's this. Hans, do you want me to uh, see if people want to answer? I mean, it's oh, pretty. Yeah. I, think, I think it's pretty obvious, but uh, maybe some people have some suggestions. Yeah, I thought so too. Yes. Okay. So somebody did guess Argentum nitricum. That's correct. <laughs> now there you go. Now look again at it. 
The first symptom comes from a conductor on the railroad, age 35 and married, of very intemperate habits and addicted to excessive venery. The second one comes from Mr. G. Mac C. Now, notice that on number three, he often awakes his wife or child, it says in Materia Medica, but the case says his two-year-old child. So case two, three, and four are all from the same man. Where do we find them? There is where we find them. Psych. I gentle nitricum and nervous infections, Hanuman and Monsley, number 10, or volume number 10, July 1875. Four cases treated with the second trituration and the third elution. How about dynamic high potencies? We're not used. So, Alan's sources, proving sources, is a good thing that we have them in. There is a problem here and there that we need to check up. For that reason, I write synoptic references where I check the sources. Also, in the concordant reference, I've checked all the sources and the names. The names sometimes are a problem because the names are wrong or the names are mixed. I've given a couple of examples here. Benzenum is not benzenum, it's benzene. Uh, acetum or carbonicum often are not um, differentiated. They are taken as the same. So barita carbonica is actually not barita carbonica, it's barita acetica. So it is well calcarea. The reason was, and you can find it in the old pharmacopoeias, the first one is from Jar in the 1840s. You have to check it there. He says that the carbonicum is the trituration because it cannot be dissolved and the acetum is the, uh, the attenuation, that's the dilution that's used in alcohol. That was the main reason for, for differentiating them. But in the provings, they're usually either mixed or separated, but in the Materia Medica put under carbonicum. Same in plumbum. What stands on the plumbum metallicum actually has not been caused by plumbum metallicum. Most of it and most of the poisonings by the lead poisonings come either from the acetum or from the carbonicum. So it is with the sulfuricum and the sulfuratum that makes a big difference. Chemically, that is. Homeopathic, perhaps not. But the sulfuricum is the sulfate and the sulfuratum is the sulfide. Argentum is mixed there. The new proving of Louis Klein is called sulfuricum, but it is not the sulfuricum, it's the sulfuratum. Cadmium is called the sulfuratum, and Herring makes a reference to a man who uh, used to treat eye complaints with the sulfuratum. That would be very, very bad idea. It's the sulfuricum. Phosphoricum and phosphoratum are mixed in the literature under zinc. Um, Scholten says that it is zinc phosphoricum. No, it zinc phosphoratum. It makes a big difference. Zinc phosphide is very toxic. Zinc phosphide phosphate is not. Then sometimes the source is split off from where it came from, but it should be put under where it came from. We have a remedy called saponinum, which is a saponin, but it was a crude form, it was chemically not pure, it was derived from the wood of the plant called saponaria, so it should be put there, it should not be put separate on an, an um, impure chemical. So it is with pictoxinum, it suggested that it is chemically pure from the seeds of the coccolis wrong because it cannot be made that way. So it should be placed back on the coccolis. Same as centoninum, it's the active ingredient of Sina. Same as macrotinum, which was an, uh, an eclectic preparation made from Actea, or as we call it, Simisifuga. Same as Dioscorine and same as Helonin. These were separated, and in Allen you find them often separated, but that is incorrect because they were chemically impure. Then, certain of the sources we need to check and we need to follow the trail. Eupas tiute is strictos tiute. You see there Lesh. Lesh is the author of the name. 
we follow the author of the name. We see what he did. We see that in 1803, he landed on Java because he was ill and he had been left had to be left behind on that island. So what did he do with his time? He investigated the local flora. And under the local flora, he found a liana, which was highly toxic and that he called strychnos tiute. But he used the local name, mupas, which means poison, to indicate that. And that's how it got in the homeopathy. He brought it back to Paris where a cafetier and the other fellow found that it contained strychnine. Then the second person connected to this is a man called Horsfield who uh, performed numerous experiments with Tuyute on animals and he described it as a large winding shrub, in other words a liana, and he called the plant locally Chechik. So if we check that name Chechik we come to that strychnos diute is Ignatia. There is no way around it. Now, certain of the websites still keep them separated because they claim that, for instance, Kew Gardens, who had a site called The List, doesn't separate them or doesn't say that they are synonyms. But they simply haven't done the work to find out that they are synonyms because you need to do some work and you need to follow some trails. Translation errors, almost there. Argentum nitricum, translated by uh, Allen from a uh, self-experimentation by a man called Kramer in about 1820 or 1830. It might be a, a couple of a days off there or years off, where it is translated as faintness in the precordial region. Faintness, but it, it actually says fullness in the cardiac region. That's a big difference. Bellus perennis, there is a Materia Medica by a man called Stevenson. That is a very thin black Materia Medica and that are translations from German provings, for instance, by Metzger from German. And Stevenson is a very bad translator, very bad. I have pointed it out in Prisma, all the mistakes that he has made under Bellus Perennis and under um, Calcarea Fluorica, I believe. Now it says, and it still stands in the Materia Medica, you can find it in the repertory from some, sensation as uterus were pulled upward. Now that definitely would qualify as peculiar. Upward? Well, look at the word on the right side of upward, upwards. That's German, but it means downward. So it seems that Stevenson just translated from the sound of it. Upward sounds like upward. There we are. That's why the uterus feels as if it was pulled upward. It was not pulled upward, it went downward. That needs to be corrected, but strangely enough, these things simply don't want to disappear out of our repertories. However many times you point it out, they are still there. Then, Hecla Lava, the name actually is wrong, it was not lava. It says in Clark, the finer ash, and uh, finer ash is not lava from Mount Hecla, which is in Iceland, falling in distant localities. Falling? How can lava fall? Lava flows. Then Clark says that it contains silica, alumina, lime, magnesia, and some iron oxide. He is wrong. Hecla lava should be Hecla tephra. That's what it is. You can find it in the literature, all these Hecla um, er eruptions were tephra and they called fluorosis. They contain fluorides, not silica. That's why you have the, the, the problems in the teeth and that's why you have the, um, how do you call them, the distortions in the jaws. It's a fluor compound, so it should be compared with fluoric acid, not with silica. And then almost there, Lapis albus, the white stone, comes from from Grauvogel, and from uh, no one actually knows what it is. Some believe that it is a uh, sort of 
mixture of silica and fluor and uh, calcium and herring acid is not nice with nice is sort of stone and uh, Graufogel says now look the inhabitants of the valley and he speaks of the inhabitants of the valley in Austria so in the Alps which are the mountains there along the river have thick necks and often goiters of immense size after drinking the waters of the Acha that's the river on purpose for several weeks my thyroid gland also commenced to swell well all the all compliments to von Graufogel he has a very nice materia medica but this is just plain nonsense because the coiters have nothing to do with the drinking of the water whatever river it is it has to do with endemic coiters because there is no thyroid um, matter there is no iodine in the Alps and that's a known problem in the Alps now that it's solved because iodine has been added to their food or to their salt this has nothing to do with the Labus Albus then finally this the reason why I believe we should connect the substance to the materia medica as a checkup as an additional source for information and also to distinguish the important from the less important let me give you this example I was studying Sabadilla which is a plant and then said the flowers are composed of six withering persistent petaloid peoples I said withering persistent so I looked it up what withering persistent is it's called marcosens in botany and it, research, uh, it refers to plant parts that don't fall off but stay on like what you can see in certain trees the, the leaves stay on although they are brown and they're wrinkled and they're withered but they're still on that's not uncommon with leaves but it is very uncommon with flower parts so we look at the word withering persistent a relationship to withered parts that don't fall off they it is as if they are dead but still there look then in the materia medica of Sabadilla isn't that remarkable then that we find a sense of withering and shrinking like that of dead persons in the materia medica as if they had written or read something about the botany well I think from this discussion you can see how many things we've taken for granted as practitioners so the mastery that Franz brings forward in his Materia Medica is especially the most recent synoptic or concordant reference second edition is to include the accumulated corrections over 20 years of study he's named a few now but there's many 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 others you probably won't even notice they're there because they uh, unless you compare other Materia Medicas but that's the kind of precision that we really need to be able to rely on 100% when we're prescribing. So on that note, why don't we open it up to um, questions. questions? Yeah, first of all, I, Franz and Linda, I want to thank you very much. And Franz especially, I want to just thank you personally because it's really nice as a practitioner of this great science and art to know that there's somebody out there day in and day out doing the work you know, going through the literature, finding the corrections, you know, making all of these additions, making sure that the bedrock of our science is accurate and reliable. And so I just want to personally thank well, you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kim. Well, I can tell you that over the last time, much of the information that you can find back in the guiding symptoms, if you have these journals, has become available on the net so I've collected over the last years hundreds and hundreds of journals including hundreds of German and I can read German so that's not a problem but what excites me in this is for instance I read in a journal called Hoeveland's Hoeveland's journal of Praktische Heilkunde of 1797 an article by Samuel Hahnemann on the very first time that he prescribed Ferratum album and that I find that exciting mm. and that I can find these kind of things back from the past 
It's so important, Franz, the work you're doing. I, you know, I just want to, before I get into the questions, there are a lot of questions here. I'm going to start asking them. Uh, thank you, everybody who's on the call. We've, we've got quite a large, large audience tonight, and uh, there's some excellent questions here. But I just want to mention, you know, when I used to have your, uh, when I used to use your program, uh, your, your, the one of the homeopathic software programs, and uh, it was very interesting that we would do searches in the, in the literature, and if we did a search without your book. The results that we would get without the concordant reference would be significantly inferior to the results that you would get when you had the concordant reference in there. In other words, the remedies that would come up as reflecting those symptoms would be much more accurate when it included the concordant reference. And I never quite understood that because the concordance reference was basically a composite of all these different books which already existed in the program. But somehow, Somehow, something, some emergent quality had developed that when you had your book in there, somehow, I don't know, I don't know if I could ever understand this, somehow it was able to produce more reliable results, even though you had taken it from the sources which were already in the, in the software program. Now, I never quite understood that, but something magical has occurred with that book. And, and I want to, again, I want to... Well, the, the concordant is 2,200 pages, and I can tell you that of every symptom in the... Um, Concordant, I've read every single word mm -hmm. and I compared every single word against every other single word. Mm -hmm. Simple as it is. So s sometimes one says arm, the other says elbow. One says left leg, the other one says right leg. So what's it going to be? Mm -hmm. Well, you cannot just simply skip over it. You have to find it out. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. Mm -hmm. I find it out. Fantastic. All right, let's get into the questions. Uh, so the first one here says, uh, first of all, this is an acknowledgement. He says, uh, the person uh, says, I love Prisma and look forward to another book along those lines, covering more remedies with more of their history and archetypes associated with them. Is it true that such a book is in the works? If so, when do you think it would be available? There are three books in the work after Concordant Reference, second edition. The first will be a synoptic, refer a synoptic reference number two, contains 606 remedies, 450 new ones uh, since 1990. A lot of proofings have been done over the last 25 years. I have them all, whether they're English or German or whatever language they are, I have them from Russia, and etc. So I have put that all in synoptic reference number two. will come out in... About three months. Yeah, May or June. Yeah. And then synoptic reference number one, the second edition has 505 remedies, most of them traditional ones. And then I've redone Prisma, which is going to be called Prisma uh, 2, which I have uh, enlarged to 222 remedies. I have something with numbers, so 606, 505, 222, it needs to have a nice number. So um, that's in the mix. And this is a set uh, that uh, have all been reissued with going over with even finer fine tooth comb than before. And it's not just the addition of information that, uh, that we learn. Things change in botany. Things change in zoology. New information comes. So they've all been upgraded not only to correct uh, things that were in the original Materia Medicas, but also to make sure all the plants and, and animals are in their correct families, that the names are correct, and that's an ongoing process because they, they change. And it is important when we use families or source material for prescribing that we have it absolutely 100% correct. So I couldn't sit still and just accept that the mistakes I made in Prisma unknowingly that they were mistakes at the days that I made it, it was in 2001. I had to correct them. I cannot sit still and still claim that Tarantula Hispanica is Tarantula. It isn't. And I can prove it. And I have shown that in Prisma too. I had to correct it. I cannot keep on telling stories about Tarantula Hispanica as being a wolf spider and all these things, what wolf spiders do, and it isn't. So it needed to be removed. Um, that, that's Prisma's second edition, not, not second volume. So uh, in total, there is Concordant Reference, second edition, the one that's on, uh, available now. Then there will be Synoptic Reference, volume one, second edition. Synoptic Reference, volume two, first edition. And then Prisma, second edition. 
and these will uh, be coming out uh, o over the next year. Great. Okay, here's another question. Uh, the person asks, if you were to acknowledge a division between science and art, would you see yourself as more a scientist or an artist or equal parts of both? <laughs> um, I myself see myself as a very tenacious, patient, persevering person who goes into the, till I get to the last dot and the last, um, how do you say that in the American, the, the T, the... Cross the T and dot the right. I. Right. I need to get to the bottom of things. So if, if that would be an artistic quality, then I would be an artist, but I do think it's more a, a personal quality, and I wouldn't know whether it's called science or, or art. I just need to get to the bottom of things. Well, speaking as a clinician, I can say that his science makes my art possible. <laughs> Great. So, we've, uh, Franz and Linda, we've had a number of questions people have uh, asked. I know it's kind of a funny question, but I'm going to ask anyway. A lot of people have asked that they they already own a copy of Concordant, either the 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 green one, various editions of the green one. I've had people ask me this quite a number of times, or they had the the one that was published in in India, though with the purple cover, and they want to know uh, why they should even think about investing in the the second edition of the Concordant reference. Well. I just would say if you have a green one, your book is at least 17 years old. So if you're still using a 17-year-old computer, then I would say it's probably worthwhile to stay with a 17-year-old book. But computers upgrade, books upgrade, materials upgrade, so absolutely, unconditionally, if you're still having that 17-year-old book, for the sake of your patience and your own knowledge, you need to upgrade to the Concordant Reference Second Edition. And then I'll let Franz address the, the, the changes that have occurred between the first edition and the second edition. There are three concordant Materia Medicas. These are the green ones. The last one is most complete. So the last one is mainly herring because, as I have explained earlier, in that day I believed that herring contained everything, provings and clinical and so on. Everything was in herring. I understood later I was wrong. So what I've done in the concordant reference in the first, the pink one from India, 1207 remedies, I've added handbook from Allen. Handbook from Allen. The handbook from Allen is the selection that Allen made on his own encyclopedia, which he found most reliable. The second edition of Concordant Reference, of which you see the picture there, the dark purple one coming from Scotland, has 77 remedies more, which are not in the handbook, but are in the encyclopedia. Now it's all complete. Everything that's in the encyclopedia is in the Concordant Reference second edition. We have to realize that if you were looking for the symptoms of Hahnemann, you will not find them in herring. It sounds unbelievable, but it is un uh, unbelievable, but it is true. There might be a single one from ha Van Hahnemann because Herring well, had no intentions of writing something that Alan already had done. Alan was 10 years before Herring, so Herring was a complement, an addition to what Alan had done, but I didn't understand that in these days. I thought that Herring included everything that Alan had done. That's wrong. So therefore, Alan already had to complete Hahnemann, the Materia Medica Pura, and the Chronische Krankheit had he in it. So Herring didn't have to do it anymore, and it was not his intention. If he has anything in provings, it's his own provings. They are there. They are there. So. In other words, concordant reference is complete. It's in balance. There is much more balance between clinically observed and that has nothing to do with provings. We need to underline that. I cannot say that often enough. We believe, because Kent made us believe, that the higher grade symptoms are confirmed proving symptoms. Wrong, wrong, wrong. These are singularly one time observed clinical symptoms from a number of prescribers from the days of Herring. 
That's what they are. They don't deserve a higher gradation. Therefore, if you follow that line, everything is out of balance. Everything is out of balance and you're going to prescribe according to a, a number of traditional remedies which were in use in the days of herring. And beyond that, there is nothing. Beyond that should be Alan. Alan has a lot of things that have never been clinically observed. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't know about it. Maybe it does play a role. Maybe we can use it somehow if we understand that what we have been using so often from herring in the belief that it was more reliable because it was based on more observation and confirmation. If we skip that part, if we understand that it's not the case, the value of herring is not automatically more than Alan, despite the gradations that Alan uh, can put to it. So to correct that basic, I wouldn't say blondo because I didn't know, to correct that, I had to make the concordance reference. Hmm. Very good. There's a couple of comments here. I just want to read them to you about. The, unfortunately, I must leave early, but I would like to thank Franz for the extremely interesting discussion of his work. I use concordant in my clinical practice. It's simply a wonderful work. Here's another one. Such a great work he has done. Um, I think we probably have time for just a few more questions. I do want to mention again that uh, we have just a limited supply left of the Concordant Reference Second Edition at the special $145 price. The regular price is $190. So if you are interested, I would definitely take advantage of the opportunity of getting it at a very discounted uh, price. Uh, here's a, uh, another question. All provings are done more than 100 years ago. Do you believe we have to reprove all our homeopathic medicines to get symptoms in the present context? Oh, no. Oh no, because the core of a remedy cannot change. Because the core of a remedy would have to be related to the substance. The external conditions of proofers, etc., of course play a role, but it cannot be the core. This is the, uh, one of the great problems of homeopathy. We cannot reprove things because of the simple reason that many things have not been classically proven. If we look at the number of provings that we have and how the materia medica on the basis of provings can be divided, let's say we have 1,200 and we skip everything from Hahnemann and we ask ourselves how have they been produced, then I would say out of the 1,200, just as an average number, 600 are poisonings, 300 are um, self-experimentations, and 300 one could call something else. For instance, classical. Classical suggests that in the proving of the substance, more than one person has been involved, preferably from both genders, preferably with a range of ages. Doesn't happen. Because all the poisonings, the 600 that I mentioned, either called involuntary proving, accidental proving, uh, poisoning, intoxication, or whatever. There are always one person. You don't, you don't have a poisoning of 10 people that, that, that leads to any useful symptoms. So poisonings are always single person. Self-experimentation, by the name of it, is one person. So when we have 900 out of 1,200, and this is not just a random number that I tell you, 75% of our material, material is not classical. That's one. The second is, there is no such thing as 30C proving in the old days. They didn't exist. We made it up. Keller made it. Kent made it up because he misread things. All provings are done just on the poisonous level. Tinctures, low potencies, and so on, and so on. So, if we would start reproving all that stuff, what would it bring more than confusion? What would it bring more than more idiosyncrasies, self-experimentations, effects of people instead of effects of substances. What we need to do is we need to realize where it is from and we need to study the substance to see what the boundaries are of that substance, what it can bring us, and compare that what we have in the Materia Medica as a checkup measure. That's the only way out. Okay, very good. We're, we're basically out of time. There, is, there have been a number of questions about uh, when will the concordant reference second edition be added to 
reference works and the um, well reference works. Um, I know that the concordant uh, reference first edition is in there now. I don't think you you've given it to them yet, have you, Franz? No, no, the second edition will second. take at least. Yeah, yeah. For, before it's a it, the the concordant reference first edition and synoptic reference volume one first edition are available now in the reference works and uh, the uh, the second editions and the synoptic reference volume two are are quite a bit down the line so it really would be behoove people to buy what they what's available now so they can use it over the next couple of years because it's not imminent that the the published books are going to be out on the market for quite some time before the electronic version would be ready but it suffices very very well to to buy what's available for the computer the first editions of concordant reference and synoptic reference volume one okay great unfortunately we're out of time i know you you both are very generous with your time so you'll you'll, you'll join us again for another one of these sessions i want to thank everybody for their participation their excellent questions sorry that i wasn't able to get to everybody's questions uh it's just we have a limited amount of time Franz and Linda, thank you again for all you do for homeopathy. It's it's so generous. It's our pleasure. Yeah, our pleasure. Yeah. And so everyone have a very good evening, and uh, we'll see you on the next one of these. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.